Hey everyone, Arlington Matrix here. Today we're taking a quick look at combustion chemistry, specifically looking at adiabatic flame temperature, more specifically of a constant pressure process. Most of this will also apply to a constant volume process, except that you'll be using a uh, different representation of the internal energy. Uh, for constant pressure, we are of course using enthalpy, which basically includes the uh, specification of boundary work. So let's get started. We're gonna be taking a look at propane. Now, just for starters here, we're going to define what is the adiabatic flame temperature. The adiabatic flame temperature is the temperature that you would receive from full combustion of the uh, chemical reaction that we're given here, assuming that there is no heat transfer out of the uh, out of the combustion chamber. So basically, basically our total enthalpy is assumed to be constant between the start and the finish of the reaction. Uh, so basically, we would write that out as... The sum of the product enthalpy is equal to the sum of the reactant enthalpy, and that's considering the entire enthalpy. This includes the enthalpy of formation of the molecule, plus the change in enthalpy going from the initial temperature to the final temperature. Now, of course, that change in enthalpy can be obtained a couple of ways. You can either obtain it by assuming a temperature and using a constant specific heat evaluator at that temperature, or you could alternatively get an equation that represents the constant pressure specific heat ratio and integrate over the temperature range. And uh, finally, you could uh, just look it up in a table as well. Uh, for this problem, we are going to be using the uh, final assumption here. We're going to be gathering that from a table that is in a textbook. So we will be considering the combustion of propane in air at an initial temperature of 298 Kelvin, and we are looking to calculate the adiabatic flame temperature based on a constant pressure process. So first, as with any combustion problem, we're gonna be taking a look at the stoichiometric equation. So this is the basic form of our stoichiometric equation with uh, A, B, C, and D simply as constants that will be determined based on the balance of the uh, atomic elements in the reaction. In this particular instance, we're assuming complete combustion and we're assuming that there are no alternative products being formed such as carbon monoxide or nitrous oxide or you know, atomic oxygen or ozone, anything like that. We're just assuming that this is a perfectly stoichiometric reaction with no alternative combustion products. So we will be able to, so we will determine the uh, values of A, B, C, and D with a simple, with a simple uh, atom balance between the left and right sides of the equation. So we know that there's uh, three carbon atoms on the left-hand side of the equation, and there's three, there should be three carbon atoms on the right-hand side. So therefore, B must be equal to three. We can uh, compute a similar property with uh, carbon. Based on the values of B and C, we can therefore calculate A. So to calculate the value of A, that's just going to be A equals 2B plus C over 2. That's just 2 times 3. 2 times 3 is 6. Plus 4 divided by 2. That's equal to 5. And from that, we can calculate the value of D. D equals 5 times 3.76. And therefore, we can write our full stoichiometric equation using these ratios. So this is our stoichiometric equation. This tells us uh, basically the molar ratios of each individual element taking place in the combustion. We have propane on the left there, C3H8, one mole of that, plus 5 moles of standard air. That's 1 oxygen plus 3.76 nitrogen. Uh, that's about 21% oxygen and 70-something uh, nitrogen. That goes to form 3 carbon dioxide, 4, uh, four water, and 18.8 .8 nitrogen. Note that this is a very idealized uh, situation. Uh, in reality, you would have some carbon monoxide from incomplete combustion. You might have some dissociation of the products. Uh, you might also have nitrogen oxide or nitri nitrous oxide emissions as well. Uh, however, in this idealized case, we're using stoichiometric error, and we're just going to be calculating the adiabatic flame temperature based on that. Now, in this problem, we're also assuming that we're just using stoichiometric error, so our equivalence ratio is going to be equal to 1. If we had an equivalence ratio that was not equal to 1, then we would have to adjust the amount of air in our air fuel, uh, our air fuel mixture. Uh, basically, we're doing the enthalpy balance. 
So we're taking the enthalpy of the reactants, that's equal to the enthalpy of the products, and of course we are going to be multiplying that by these molar ratios that we have in our stoichiometric equation. So let's just get the uh, enthalpies of formation first. And I'm going to be uh, getting these values from the tables at the back of the uh, textbook linked in the description below. That textbook is Introduction to Combustion, Concepts and Applications, 3rd edition by Stephen R. Turns. Now an interesting note for uh, nitrogen and oxygen here, since these are diatomic, that's their natural state, the enthalpy of formation at any given temperature is just going to be equal to zero, because naturally nitrogen and oxygen want to be in that diatomic state of either N2 or O2. And so finally we can write that uh, enthalpy balance equation that we had above there. We'll uh, write that out using these enthalpies of formations and the change of enthalpy uh, for a given temperature. Now, of course, we also need to note that we're multiplying by the uh, mole fractions that we have. So for CO2, that's multiplied by 3. And uh, note that for diatomic nitrogen, this enthalpy of formation is 0. And now we just plug in the enthalpy of formations for each one. And we need to uh, make sure that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side to get our adiabatic flame temperature. So we're going to be moving these enthalpies of formation onto the other side so that we can solve strictly based on our adiabatic flame temperatures. Therefore, we know that uh, approximately 2,044,170 kilojoules per kilomole should be equal to three times the change in enthalpy of CO2 for the uh, change in temperature plus four times the change in enthalpy of H2O for the change in temperature, plus 18.8 .8 times the change in enthalpy for diatomic nitrogen for the given adiabatic flame temperature. So now we just need to figure out at what temperature the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, and therefore we would have our adiabatic flame temperature as defined by that uh, constant enthalpy. So for this, we're going to be making a table based on the... Uh, some of the values in the tables at the back of that turns textbook that I mentioned earlier. So this is basically uh, the equation that we have up here. 3 delta HCO2 plus 4 delta HH2O plus 18.8 .8 delta HN2. And uh, we're going to be getting these delta H values from the table. So, noting that we need the left-hand side to be equal to the right-hand side, therefore we're looking for this number 2.04417 times 10 to the 6. We know that that's going to be somewhere in between these last two. Therefore, we can just do a simple linear interpolation to calculate approximately where the adiabatic flame temperature should lie. This is uh, just a simple linear interpolation. It's the actual value minus the lower value divided by the upper value minus the lower value to interpolate linearly between two values in a table. Very quick, very simple. So we get an approximate adiabatic flame temperature of 2393.2 Kelvin. Now if we wanted to get this more exact, we could uh, further discretize this uh, region between 2000 Kelvin and 2500 Kelvin to get a little bit more of an accurate answer, but we should be pretty close, within 5% at least. Uh, given how crude this approximation is, we have very few combustion products at stoichiometric and we're assuming full reaction, um, full complete combustion and everything. It's not really something that would be accurate in the real world. So for the most part, for any calculations, you'd be using this adiabatic flame temperature. That uh, temperature that we calculated should be good enough. And that's basically how you would calculate adiabatic flame temperature. If you wanted it to be a little bit more crude, you could use a constant specific heat ratio and just solve for adiabatic flame temperature directly and then do an iterative process. I find using the tables to be a little bit more accurate in general. Now, from the textbook that I mentioned before, they suggest an adiabatic flame temperature around somewhere uh, 2267 Kelvin. So that's reasonably close. So I'm Arlington Matrix. This has just been a simple solution for the... Uh, stoichiometric ratio of propane to air burning under adiabatic conditions to determine the adiabatic flame temperature. This is a very ideal situation and in the real world you would have a very different result. However, yeah, it's just a simple, uh, simple solution, adiabatic flame temperature. If you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section below. Thanks for tuning in and have a great day.